Good evening and welcome to City Lights, the program that talks about issues facing our lovable city. My name is Fred Lees and I'm a volunteer and president of the board of the Architectural Heritage Center, uh, owned and operated by the Bosco Milligan Foundation. We are talking tonight uh, about the what some people call the epidemic of demolitions in Portland neighborhoods. We started this conversation with some of us a month ago and we're back to continue it further. There are so many issues uh, that have tied up in this. The Oregonian uh, recently reported uh, a, a, a counting 2,300 homes torn down, uh, single-family homes torn down since 2003. I think that number is really low because it doesn't include what we call the virtual demolitions where you could leave the chimney standing uh, and build something entirely new around the chimney and the city did not consider that a demolition. Anyway, the issues have to do with affordability of housing, uh, human health of people that live next to these demolitions with the effects of lead paint and asbestos, uh, carbon footprint and demolition waste on the larger scale of, of, uh, uh, of the environment, tree canopy, stormwater runoff of these, from these larger houses, solar access uh, for generating electricity and loss of solar access to people's gardens, uh, sense of place in our traditional neighborhoods and, and the design and the architecture uh, of, our, of our vintage architecture. Uh, people with me to talk about all this tonight, and we've got way more than we'll ever get to. Uh, Sarah Long from the Elliott neighborhood and has been active in United uh, Neighborhoods for Reform. Uh, uh, Robert McCullough from East Moreland, also the president of Southeast Uplift, uh, the Southeast Neighborhood Coalition. Uh, Jack Bookwalder from the Beaumont Wilshire neighborhood, uh, which was one of the first neighborhoods uh, that really started to feel the heavy pressure of the demolitions and was, I think, all the, really the founders of United Neighborhoods Reform came right. out of Beaumont Wilshire. Uh, and, and Carol McCarthy uh, from Multnomah, another neighborhood that uh, uh, has, has been less active at the city council and in United Neighborhoods for Reform, but has felt the impact of demolitions very much. Let's just go around and briefly, and each of you hit the issue that is most important to your heart on this. Sarah? Oh boy, um, I have two children under the age of six. That is the demographic most affected by lead paint. Um, if they are to inhale it or eat paint chips or dust, um, it affects them the worst. Um, and, and the issue with that is really brain damage, isn't it? I mean, that's the long-term effect of, of lead poisoning with there's children. No is brain damage. It. Yeah. There's no mitigating it. There's no undoing the damage that has been done, and it is ultimately fatal. So um, I attended a renter's or a landlord's meeting uh, to learn what the landlords are doing to us, because I'm a renter, uh, put on by the city of Portland a few months ago, and they passed out sugar packets and said, this amount of lead can kill a child. And I am amazed that the... Bureau of Development Services is not aware that that is the amount of lead that can kill a child since they aren't monitoring the levels of lead at these de demolitions at all. And they do not, unlike other cities, both in our state and across the country, uh, require proof that someone has uh, mitigated the asbestos or the lead paint before they let a demolition occur. That, that's really interesting. I mean, the United Neighborhoods for Reform people have found that uh, there is no agency that pays close attention to the, to the environmental effects of the adjacent houses. Uh, Oregon OSHA has to do with the safety of the workers, and we value that, but that's not the people living next door. DEQ, for a time, was only interested in demolitions that were more than four units, weren't interested in what was happening with single-family houses. That, I'm told, is starting to change. There was a bill at the legislature that really caused DEQ to perk up their ears, and whether that will happen this session, it may be too late. Uh, but that's a fascinating issue. Robert, uh, Eastmoreland. We started early on taking on the two critical loopholes. There had been some very good lobbying that occurred over the years, and what happened was you could pretty much knock down anything you wanted without warning. There was a bizarrely named K-1 loophole, which said if you got a demolition and a construction permit on the same day, you could ignore the rest of the rules. But what you call virtual demolition uh, was remodeling. A single standing stick meant that you didn't have to follow the rules. You were remodeling even though it was one Right, stick. was not considered demolition. Those are gone. We've changed that, and luckily we don't have those anymore. Ah, uh, until April 20th, until Monday, April the 20th, new rules yeah. take effect. K-1 disappears uh, uh, next Monday. We have still had no warning demolitions, even what, yesterday? Uh, Here in Portland. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and under the new, help me if I've got this right, under the new regulations that we all lobbied for, uh, 
there is a 35-day demolition delay when they have filed. There's a notice that goes to a certain period of uh, number of surrounding properties. Uh, then if the neighborhood association wants more time, they can ask for another 60 days, uh, either to figure out whether they can find somebody else to buy the house or remove it or find some way to avoid the demolition. My guess is in the long run these won't make much difference because people don't have enough money to buy off the developer. There are so few vacant lots where you can move a house. I'm just not sure that it's real feasible, but at least will give neighbors a chance to be prepared. Well, and we've had one success in that area. We have avoided a demolition with a buyout, but it, you're right, it's very hard. And in our case, in Elliot's case, we were completely ignored. We tried to save two houses that were uh, over 100 years old each, and the, they just never responded to us. There's nothing requiring them to respond to the neighbors wanting to move this house rather than see it destroyed. Let's uh, skip over to Jack. Jack, you wear two hats. Uh, Jack is a is a uh, a professional planner in his prior life, not in this jurisdiction, uh, from elsewhere, but has also been closely involved uh, in studying the affordability aspects of mm -hmm. the demolitions. Um, I'm also a land use chair of Beaumont Wilshire Neighborhood Association and a member of UNR United Neighborhoods for Reform, and I'm very concerned about uh, preserving affordability. We are losing our our stock of entry-level housings in Portland, in the Portland neighborhoods. Um, so many, time and time again, we're seeing $300,000, $250,000 bungalows being demolished and replaced with, you know, really oh. large, bulky houses that sell for $800,000 up to a million point two million, one point two million dollars. Well, and even the skinny houses, when we get afflicted with them, I wouldn't say that those are affordable no, compared no, no, to what was not, lost. No, they're not, not at all. And, we need, to, we need to get that message out there that we are uh, for, uh, for affordability. There are many, well, at least there are some uh, people out there, especially in the, in the unregulated blogosphere, that seem to want to label us as being uh, against affordable housing for some reason. It just couldn't be further from the truth. We really need to project that more, that we are for preserving affordable housing. And we had some uh, folks from East Portland um, show up at the, uh, at the UNR summit meeting, the fourth one we had just last week. And they were saying, we really should work toward common goals because we are all for affordability. What can we do? And they had some ideas about um, um, things that have gone in other parts of the country where they've had demolition taxes, and the taxes have gone to pay for affordable housing. That's just one idea of many things that could happen. Um, we aren't necessarily advocating that right now, but things like this we want to we study. And, um, um, we also want to um, 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 find out more what other communities are doing. Uh, in the city of Berkeley, uh, just last year, Berkeley, California, um, they, their anti-demolition um, ordinance was endorsed by the Berkeley Tenants Union. So that's what we really need to get something like well, that. Well, and that's a, a, an interesting aspect, and I think Carol might want to address this too, is that uh, uh, tenants do need to be part of the discussion yes. because, I mean, the affordable housing uh, yeah, is... Definitely. And, and traditionally, it, my, my understanding of this is just the construction cost. It is not easy to build affordable, new affordable housing. Most mm -hmm. affordable housing is older homes, older apartments. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when we willy-nilly tear them down, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's, right. that's what we're losing. The economics of this is so backwards. We are eliminating affordable homes right. and replacing them right. with non-affordable homes. Right. The mantra is infill, but if all too no. often we are replacing one yeah. very livable, one very affordable, and yeah. often yeah. very beautiful yeah. home with a McMansion that is That's A, exactly not right. affordable, right. B, has eliminated the trees and green space, and, and C, is in fact 5,000 square feet on a 5,000 square foot lot mm -hmm. w with the same number of people living in it. Right. Yeah. Why don't we talk about the specific example of a recent house that was demolished in Eastmoreland and I believe it was built in 1910 and it was a second generation owned um, rental house so it had had generations of renters in it and the guy who inherited it didn't really have much interest in it and he just you know sold it off to a developer because why not and there goes a rental house. There, go there goes a formerly affordable rental house to be replaced with something that will likely cost in excess of a million dollars. That's in fill with a vengeance. Yeah. <laughs> well, in, in interesting, I'm, a, a better phrase I've heard is refill. Yeah. It's not in fill, right. it's refill. Carol? Well, also, I think in the new mixed-use zones, they're talking about adding bonuses for affordable housing. So, 
for example, in our neighborhood, we're really concerned. We don't want tall buildings because we have a funky, quaint neighborhood, and we like it human scale. But so if the height limit is 45 feet and then bonus stories for affordable housing, I mean... Yeah, no, the bonus game is scary. I mean, it is very almost scary. if you paint your toenails blue, you get extra FAR. Moreover, and, uh, Multnomah Village is attractive to families. I have a family, mm -hmm. I have friends who have, when they had kids, they're like, gee, I got to move out somewhere and get a house. And they ended up in Multnomah Village mm -hmm. because it's walkable on a hillside and it's got little houses and it was just perfect to raise kids in. And so you replace that with apartments. What are, what are you getting for those families? That's right. One of the, th I mean, I, I just, I live on the other side of town from Multnomah, but I love it. When you talk about a neighborhood sense of place, right. you drive down the Capitol Highway that runs th through the middle. Right. There is nothing on this planet like Multnomah Village. Right. Uh, and that is so precious that we should honor that, we should respect that, we should admire it, we should love it. And, and in fact, when we did a walkthrough for the mixed use zone project with the city planners, um, we stopped, you know, at the MAC, which is the Multnomah Arts Center, which is sort of the heart of our village. Mm -hmm. And they were suggesting putting apartments up in the parking lot at the MAC. And as we continued on in the walk, they were interested in putting, if the post office site became available, what about a big box store such as Walmart? <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, I mean, this was coming, you know, from the city planners. So, so much wow. they, they didn't, they, village, they didn't yeah. understand the character of the village. The city wow. planners have their own religion. It's not one that we've been invited to join. <laughs> uh, well, they and they're driving, us, yeah, they're they driving the bus. They accuse us so. of being af afraid of change. Right. But and it's not change, it's being interested in the environment, the tree canopy, under their new rules, <coughs> a new development has no trees. Right. The rhetoric is fine, but the reality is we are deforesting Portland. And we're losing huge trees, you know. There's one on, on the chopping block right now of like over 36 inches in diameter and no protection. Well, w one of the things the city did some years ago, I think, at least in the, in the northeast, I believe it was the 1993 Albina plan, was moved uh, side lots to as narrow as five feet for new, new houses. Mm -hmm. And we've had, we've had a couple of those built in Irvington. Huge houses with Huge houses, five right. feet from, uh, that's barely enough for a walkway. That's not a side yard. It gets no light. There can be no grass. There's going to be no garden. There's certainly going to be no trees. And they're blocking off the uh, sunlight from the, their neighbors. Uh, the neighbors, right. yeah. yeah. And we have an air quality problem here in Portland. It's unacknowledged because we are accustomed to how clean and freshly rained upon everything is. Right. But we have an air quality problem. We, ha we do have a lot of air toxics to begin with. We have um, industrial problems left over from previous decades when things weren't as clean. And so to add to this problem, we're tearing down all our trees. In the 70s, they recognized it. They'd say, they'd say if you can see Mount Hood, it's, it's you know, the, the air's a little better than usual. Right. Well, that's going to creep back <laughs> because we're just blithely destroying everything. And what's going to be left? No, and I remember the days you could go up to Washington Park and not see Mount Hood. It was just yellow haze in the summertime. Right. And uh, that, that was. So let me grab hold of the trees. Please, please do. A grab a tree. Hug a tree. A uh, hug a tree. We have three sequoias on Southeast Martins, 150 years old, 150 feet tall. You can see them from anywhere in the immediate neighborhood. Developers just bought that. We've investigated the legal standard. He may have to actually pay $120 to cut down those three trees. Yeah, they just, as of January 1st, reduced the prices. So that will end us up with two McMansions <laughs> running perhaps $2 million. The 120,000 is nothing. That is simply a decimal place. So where are we at the end of this? Two ugly homes, no grass, no trees. Mm -hmm. This is not fear of change. This is someone <laughs> exactly. who's wondering what wavelength are the city planning? It is on? fear of change. Who wants that change? <laughs> well, it's, and it's interesting. I mean, this issue is not uh, not just in Portland. There's so much could be said, but Los Angeles has just declared a moratorium yes, in a certain neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how expansive that is, but for two years, no more McMansions until mm -hmm. they figure out how they're going to deal Wasn't with it. Wasn't it even no more demolitions, period, in that neighborhood? In, in I am not sure about that. I'm not sure. But something we, we were talking about earlier is um, that the zoning doesn't even protect. You know, we have, because of the corner lot provisions, we, we're having 
um, lots that are zoned for 5,000 square feet, because they're on the corner, they're, uh, able, they're able to cut them in half and put up twice as many houses. And I don't think that is truth in zoning. You know, I think we need to work to stop that too. Well, it's, it's rezoning without any neighborhood input. Right. You know, sort of an automatic blanket yeah. rezone, and nobody had any say in that in the neighborhood. Right. And, and one of the other crazy little things is some of our oldest neighborhoods, Elliott may be one, yeah. were platted with mm -hmm. 2,500 uh, square foot lots, which are kind of half the standard 5,000 lot. Right. Uh, and a lot of people in the old days bought two of those lots to put up one house. Mm -hmm. But the developers are realizing, gee whiz, if it was originally platted as 2,500 feet, that is legally binding, so we can tear down that house and put up the two. Now, those yeah. lots were not originally buildable. That was yeah. a change that occurred within the last decade. That's no true. discussion. So what we ended up with is neighborhoods that were 50 by 100 or 75 by 100 suddenly became 25 by 100 without any public involvement. Right. When they were created, they were created as marketing ploys. You know, buy a double lot, which means you could get two 25 foot lots, but you weren't, you, nobody ever built nobody on, built on it. Nobody built on it. One, yeah. one of our group, one of United Neighborhoods Reforms members, worked for Multnomah County Planning back in the 70s, and it was very specific and laid out at that time. These are not buildable lots. This was just a, a marketing ploy to tell people that they were able to buy two lots. Interesting. But the other thing about the, the neighborhoods is, even though our neighborhood and the coalition, um, Sweeney, have submitted letters on, the beha on behalf of this, we don't seem to have our voice heard. So I think we should work towards getting the, each of the coalitions represented on the planning commission so that we have the voice heard before the things are enacted so we don't have to fight all this stuff downstream from that happening. May I clarify that for one second because not everyone understands our experiment in democracy. And we actually are, have a reputation all over the world for this experiment. Every neighborhood is represented. We have 95. This is grassroots democracy. Everyone gets to speak and attend. Those filter up to seven coalitions. I am chair of one coalition. Those coalitions coalesce all that, and we bring that to the city council. And so I agree with you entirely. The coalition should be recognized more. We have less money for communications every year. We have less say in city government every year. We're losing that experiment in democracy. Interesting. Well, and I, I think what's interesting out of United Neighborhoods for Reform uh, is that it is a to it started out totally grassroots. I mean, it has no budget. It has, I mean, it's extremely informal. But this demolition issue has caught such a tiger by the tail. Uh, that is still going strong over a year. We've made, gotten some changes made at City Council. I think it is getting people, I hope, re, uh, reactivated with their neighborhood associations. Mm -hmm. And uh, between so neighborhood associations, because yeah, yeah, when you sure. came to speak to ours, I mean, it was mm -hmm. really beneficial to us. But it's, uh, it, it does, it, it's gonna take a lot of cooperation. And, and then even then, all that said, if that all happens, there's no guarantee the city council will listen. But. And let's talk about the forces working against us. So we have the neighbors not included in the process. How about the people who are included in the process whose interests are purely in profit? It is not in good planning. It is not in making homes for families that are in any way affordable. Their interests are purely for their own profits, and they are directly included in the process. They are members of the Development Review Advisory Committee, which I try to attend every meeting once a month. They're on there from 8 to 9.30 a.m. in the morning on every third Thursday. Um, and they make code. They have been uh, give, tasked with making code for the Bureau of Development Services. That influences the entire city. You know, not influences. That is the code. That is the new stuff that we have to go by over the entire city. Well, this, this, uh, the city council has to approve it. Um, I mean, the history of DRAC uh, was it, it was created, I think, in the late 70s uh, when all the developers were objecting to the city's regulations and rules. Uh, and so this body was created essentially as a place to vent steam and to seek changes that were causing problems that could be easily fixed. I think where the city council made a mistake is they took a pressing public issue that affects everybody in the city and assigned it to a handful of developers on DRAC to try to deal with the demolition. That was the wrong place to send it. Now you and I are going to argue a bit about this, 
the new chair of DRAC is the neighborhood representative, but Mary Helen Kincaid. But she represents the developers. No, she does not. She represents us. No, she doesn't. She's doing a good job. No, she doesn't. <laughs> I told you we don't. I either. promise you we will argue See, about okay, this. Okay, shake the, hands and come out fighting. You right? don't go to the, the DRAC meetings. I go to every single the one. The first person from the outside ever to be asked to speak at the DRAC meeting was myself on this issue, and that was through the intervention of Mary Helen Kincaid. Yeah. We are now in much better shape than we were before. And you need to go have lunch with Mary Helen. No, thank you. Like She's asked me several well, times. And, and, and let me tell you what happened with DRAC uh, is uh, DRAC really got their ears pinned back. When all of us went down and testified, I think in January, uh, criticizing the demolition rule proposals from DRAC, uh, Charlie Hales got the message and he sat down with Amanda and said, tell DRAC we got to come up with a compromise. And so they did come up with a compromise. A and terrible I, compromise. Well, it, but it... It was that, a developer-heavy compromise. It, it was, but that, you know, that's what democracy, at least as we perceive democracy, is involved in compromise. And it, it was a step forward. Mm -hmm. And I think the developers got the message, they're not, the city council is not always going to listen to us. And the overview committee that is looking at the implementation of the demolition language is being chaired by Jeff Fish, who's a developer, and myself. Well, and so. <laughs> there is a problem with that. Jeff Fish has completed his two terms that he is limited to on DRAC and is no longer part of the committee. But he is the most no, influential. Neither am I, by the way. Well, that's why they did that. They added you because, I don't know. They added you because, well, Jeff Fish is, isn't on DRAC. Gee, how do we fix this? We really want Jeff to still have all the control. Okay, let's add someone else who everyone knows is anti-demolition, and then it will be okay that Jeff's in charge. Well, it's a very weak and easily uh, folded over job. <laughs> well, my, my favorite Jeff Fish story is the one meeting I went to. He ended by saying, I spent 25 years building starter houses, and now I can't make any money building starter houses. Mm -hmm. So... So now he's out tearing down starter houses to build houses that he make money on. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Appreciate it. If you Google Jeff Fish in New York Times, you will find a very entertaining article from 1999 in which he completely slimes Charlie Hales up and down for instituting the ban against uh, snout, snout houses. houses. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody remember uh, snout houses? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, suppose that we can't have design review, but they did it in stout houses. That was, if that doesn't wasn't design review, what was it? Well, that interesting, and I I would love to have you talk a little bit about uh, where we're going to go from here. Charlie Hales wants to convene a task force to try to figure out, short of design review, uh, what kind of regulations should we have for the new houses right. that go up? Well, and the, what well, are the options? What can they well, do? One of the uh, one of the tenets of a uh, resolution for you and I was to, we asked the city to make uh, a task force that would discuss um, a building replacement, what's going to go in there after the, uh, the buildings are, are torn down. And the idea is to make them as restrictive as possible to, number one, discourage um, demolition, but number two, for the ones that did get uh, torn down and replaced, which we know there will be some, uh, that they, you know, fit in the neighborhood and are not like these, you know, monsters that just land there from outer space. And, um, and uh, Mayor Hales uh, at the hearings was pretty receptive to that. And he has uh, created this task force that's going to be looking into the issue. Um, they're going to be staffing this summer, hopefully, I wish it was sooner, but... Um, yeah, I'd heard it was going to be 18-month process, and he yeah, hasn't even appointed the people well, yet, that's, has he? that's going to be the problem, yeah. Uh, who's going to be on this task force, and uh, how long will it take? But at least, uh, you know, at least they're supportive of, of doing something. Uh, they want to look at... Um, uh, Mayor Hills it says specifically he wants to look at issues like bulk and mass and um, um, setbacks. setbacks and lot coverage and and things to make to make the new buildings as compatible with with the neighborhoods as possible. So that's that's really that, good. that could be a step forward. I, I I think what's interesting out of all of this is that we are seeing uh, in a larger scale the discussion about economic inequality in this society. And I, I think this is one of the manifestations of it. Particularly uh, the, that it's deepening and worsening. It, it is. The people c that can buy the bigger houses are building the bigger houses. Uh, rents are going to go up or the affordable houses disappear. Where do those people go? It's going right. to put more pressure on rents. And so. what's happening at the very bottom end, where the very cheapest houses <coughs> used to be? People are becoming homeless because there is nothing left. There is nothing left 
that costs a few dollars. You know, there, there's when when people now on the on at the very end at the very bottom end of society, they have no options left, and we have more homeless people than ever before when we were supposed to have eliminated by now. So often when they talk about the equity lens, you realize they have the telescope the wrong way away. Yes. <laughs> wrong way around. Yes. We really are not paying much attention to that distribution of income issue. The neighbors who live over on Hawthorne and Belmont are seeing themselves priced out their homes, crushed with five-story buildings. It's a different world. Yeah. And no, a family really can't is. live in those apartments. Is, are, is, has anyone built a three-bedroom apartment in Portland? Anyone? Well, I, I mean, there are some two bedrooms, but I was fascinated. I have a, a son who's young and single, uh, and any of these new apartments, or even for a studio, mm -hmm. are at least a thousand dollars a month. He's oh, in yeah. a, he's in a historic mm -hmm. building that's on the National Register, yeah. uh, the, the old Commodore Apartments downtown. Oh, yes, has a studio uh, <laughs> for eight hundred a month, and that's what that's old deal. old it's buildings yeah. are. Old. It is, yeah. and it's you affordable. know, and so the new buildings are not affordable. The old buildings are. The, the new buildings. They they, they waive the uh, the parking uh, requirements for many of them in the, right. in, in the justification that it would somehow make them pencil out for more affordable housing, but it hasn't worked at all. Yeah. You know, the, the new apart parkingless uh, parking apartment buildings are like, really expensive. And yeah. furthermore, the parking simply gets exported to the neighborhood. Yeah. Exactly. I, it's, by the way, just to remind people, because facts tend not to be part of our planning, <laughs> as of this year, we have as many cars in Portland as we had before the recession. At the end of this year, we will have more cars than we had before the recession. Especially as people get priced out of the center of the city and get pushed out further and mm. further and further, people, particularly people with families like myself. Yeah, you have to. Yeah, you, it, It's hard to live without a car. Uh, I, I, I'm less hung up over the car issue than a lot of people uh, because you, you look a lot of the great cities of the world. You can't take a car into San Francisco. It mm -hmm. just doesn't work. You, don't want, it, you don't want to take a car into New York. Right, because uh, they have that thorough, complete... <clears throat> Uh, tram system, whereas we have, we, we need to build up ours up a lot more. Yeah, well, it, uh, a lot of issues. Uh, it, it, we're getting real close to the end of our time. There was, a, isn't there a deconstruction advisory group that is looking at deconstruction versus They're uh, starting as opposed right to now. They're starting. Right. And that is supposed to be wrapped up sometime, I think, by June, didn't they say? I believe so, yeah. yeah. The yeah. next meeting of that advisory committee, which is a public meeting, I had to drag the information out of them. They really like to hide it. It's on the tw April 29th, and I will get that information if you want to go ahead. All right. And I would just like to urge people, I mean, I think the Occupy movement was to address the inequality and primarily for the income. Economic, right. And I would urge people listening to Occupy the Neighborhood Associations. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a way to get power into the neighborhoods. Yeah. We're, we're all in it together. We right. have to remember that. And uh, folks, we are out of time. Thanks so much for being here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Good night and good luck. <laughs> I think Edward Weber Murrow used to say that. Yes, he did. Yeah. <laughs> I only know that Good because of the 2005 movie. Tomorrow. Come visit us. <laughs>